You hate your job? You can't get along with a coworker? Your boss annoys you? Learn how spirituality can change your work environment. Next on Living Smart. Hello, I'm Patricia Gross. Welcome to Living Smart, a new series about getting the most out of life. Today, Cindy Graves Wigglesworth teaches us how spirituality in the workplace can improve teamwork, productivity, and your quality of life. Have pen and paper ready. At the end of the show, we'll give you some resources. I find that we're very confused about love and all the world religions teach us to love one another, but they don't always tell us how. Cindy Graves Wigglesworth constantly questions, researches, and then shares the wisdom she picks up. How do you love all of these annoying people in your life? Or how do you deal with the difficult boss? How do you deal with the coworker who's always not answering the telephone when you go take your coffee break? As a child, she lived with her oil executive dad and artist mom in India and Australia, two places that challenged her own comfortable existence. First, in India. At that tender age, being exposed to all that suffering and death was very formative. How could there be so much suffering in the world if there really was a God? Then in Australia, during the Vietnam War. In this situation, I got to experience being despised for something I had no control over. And while most of the Australians were very friendly to me, it was a few episodes of just being vehemently attacked as a Yankee. Um, and my only comeback that I could think of that would be like not inflammatory was to say, I'm not a Yankee, I'm a Confederate. I was born south of the Mason-Dixon line. And they'd look at me with this incredibly puzzled look on their face because they didn't know American history. As a result, Cindy went on to do graduate studies in international politics. Because the clash of cultures and the misunderstanding and the lack of love in the world or the lack of spiritual intelligence in the world is all tied up with religion and culture and politics. She landed a job at Exxon, where she worked in human resources for two decades. She also read every book she could get on world religions and spirituality. I have been seeking the wisdom of each to pull them together so that we can have practical advice on how do we love one another in a business setting. So after 25 years, she founded her own company, Conscious Pursuits, to do just that. Every one of us is born spiritual. And one of my quests in life, because I've taken this spiritual journey very seriously, has been the how part. She now like lectures on point. issues of consciousness of why we do the things we do and now, spirituality. I've got some... Um, ideas for how to improve this um, outline for the spirit. And is writing a book on spiritual intelligence. My definition of spirituality is that it's an innate human need to be connected with something that's larger than ourselves. But essentially I like to think of it as having two pieces. A vertical piece, which means you're connecting to something you consider sacred, and a horizontal piece of being of service to each other and the planet. Now, when you go to work and you feel like you're leaving your soul at the door, you're not able to feel in connection with the sacred and you're not feeling that you're being of service to each other. And it is this disconnect that may pose problems at work. The most valuable piece of my teachings in the workplace, I think, is when I explain to people the difference between their ego self and their higher self. It depersonalizes a lot of our less admirable behaviors. Okay, let's all take a deep breath. Our egos are getting out of control here. Let's remember the steps, how to shift. Let's try and find a different way to have this interaction and then come at it from a higher self place, which is what I teach them how to do. To keep herself in that higher self and balanced, she spends her little free time painting watercolors. I balance my right brain with my left brain because it's easy in the business world to be very analytical and planning and computer work. But it's also important spiritually, I think, to focus on what is good and beautiful as opposed to what is wrong and needs to be fixed. First we need... Flour and sugar. Okay. Could you grab me the flour? Okay, Thanks. how much flour do you need? But she says it's her daughter Jessica that keeps her most focused on her life's purpose. 
An internationalist at heart, Cindy, whose blended family includes a Japanese-American husband and an adopted Korean teen, finds life without an understanding of the two aspects of who we are can lead to trouble in human interactions. We all have an ego and that's what shows up first. And you need to understand that's not the truth of who you are. There's another deeper person at the essence of that person, the spirit of that person that's behind that. If you can get to the place where you have compassion for that person, you can tap their deeper energy and they will blossom forth. Then they're just delighted to tap into their creativity to help to solve the problems. <laughs> thank you, Cindy Graves Wiggleworth. Thank you for joining us here at Living Smart. I'd like to, to ask you how you began your work in spirituality in the first place. Well, my spiritual quest, it goes back so far I can't even remember when it began. Um, but in terms of getting into spirituality and work, it really started about 10 to 15 years ago with a chronic heartache. Uh, Interesting. It was this sense of showing up for work and feeling like something was missing, but I really didn't know what. And it wasn't until about 10 years ago that I figured out it was this disconnection between my spiritual life and my work life that was bothering me. Explain the difference between religion and spirituality in the workplace because we're not yeah. supposed to mix religion with work. It's a very important distinction because people usually get them muddled up. Right. Religion is a specific set of doctrines and beliefs that teach you how to get closer to the divine. But spirituality is a broader word. It's an innate human need to be in contact with something larger than yourself. You may call that the divine or the sacred. But the how to get closer to the divine is what the specific religions teach. So you have different paths, but they're all trying to address the same need, and that need is to be spiritual. Now, I need to say some people address their spiritual needs outside of the religious path, so there's many ways to address your spiritual needs. Exactly. Now, how do you define spiritual intelligence? I know you're writing a book about it. Yes. I think it's important to get that word intelligence added on the end of spiritual because we're all born spiritual, and it's just like we all have certain latent abilities when we're born, but if you're born musically gifted and you never take a music class and you never practice piano, you're not going to be a good piano player. So if you're born spiritual, how do you develop that and become spiritually intelligent? And there's a set of 21 skills that result in what I call a spiritually intelligent person. And a spiritually intelligent person is someone who is able to be compassionate, wise, and peaceful regardless of the circumstances. So they don't just feel compassionate when they're meditating or praying or alone in the woods. They're able to be compassion and wisdom and peace regardless Examples of what's going on. Examples would be Gandhi. Gandhi, the Dalai Lama, Jesus. All of the people we think of as, as spiritual exemplars, as spiritual masters would come to mind. What are some of the principles of spirituality, would you say? Well, bringing spirituality into the workplace has a couple of really important principles, and one of them is no proselytizing. I will not work with a company where there's any hidden agenda. So it can't be about converting people to a belief system. One of my core principles is you believe what you want to believe. I will teach you what I has found, have found that works, but you have the right to believe what you want. So no proselytizing, no making anybody wrong, no, no harassment of any kind. Okay. Why is it a good idea to bring spirituality into the workplace? That's a, it's an excellent question, and businesses will ask me that. You know, like, what is this about? Why should I care about this? Well, if you have employees, I think you should care about this because human beings are innately spiritual, and when you can tap that aspect of them, you're going to end up with more passionate employees. You're going to become an employer of choice. You will be able to recruit more easily. You'll retain your employees more easily, and you'll find that the teamwork and productivity goes up tremendously because there's not so much ego conflict and drama as there used to be. So the less ego, the more productivity. Yeah, and I was going to ask you, what are the benefits to the employees? From an employee perspective, many of us feel like we're checking our souls at the door, that when we get to work, the things that matter most we've left outside, and we're coming in and following somebody else's orders, and we don't see the connection to a sacred purpose. But as an employer does spirituality in the workplace, employees can get a sense of connection to a very deep personal need, and that leads to inspiration as well as their ability to stop being so ego-driven as they learn the skills to shift to higher self, they're not so tired. 
um, the constant ego drama of the normal workplace is an exhausting experience, and we go home so tired. <laughs> so instead of going home tired, you can go home inspired, which is a much better place to be. You, you talk about ego and drama. What do you mean by that? Is that like the fighting, the bickering, the backstabbing? What, what are you talking about when you say drama and ego? Yeah, ego likes to either play victim or like self-righteous redeemer, or you know, there's these different roles we like to play. So you know, you think about office gossip. You know, it's like let's gather around the coffee pot now. You won't believe what she did now. And <laughs> you know, I like to say gossip is jet fuel for the ego. And so every office is full of all this little you know stuff, and it just gets everybody inflamed and talking. And then people say, oh, you're talking about me behind my back, and oh, the drama just gets exhausting. And meanwhile, there's no work getting done, and everybody's going home tired. So what good? is this? <laughs> How do you get rid of that kind of stuff? It happens. I mean, that's human nature, isn't it, to gossip? It is. It is human nature. And not all gossip is harmful. I mean, if you're saying something about someone else that you would say to their face, like, oh, I just heard so-and-so's engaged, isn't it wonderful? That's not harmful gossip. It's the harmful gossip that's damaging for the ego. But we are all born with egos, and it's the process of growing up and transcending it that is ultimately the spiritual journey. And I like to think of it not as destroying the ego, but taking it out of the driver's seat of the car of my life right. and put my higher self behind the driver's seat so that I'm coming from a more compassionate and wise place. What do you mean by higher self? Let's talk about that. How do you yeah. get from ego to higher self? Right. The higher self has many synonyms in the world tradition. Some people would say soul or spirit. But everyone would say that there is an aspect of themselves which is more compassionate and of which when they act from that part, they're really proud of themselves. And they don't later go, gosh, I wish I hadn't said that. So it's that aspect of yourself that is inspiring and peaceful and compassionate and wise. And when you come from that aspect, you don't regret the things that you've done. Now, shifting from ego to higher self is tricky business because the ego is the louder voice. The higher self voice is quiet. And so it's about learning to slow down your mind, slow down your breath, shift out of that place of ego hysteria, and listen for the quieter voice and take that advice. Does spirituality teach you to have a purpose in life? I would say absolutely. The deepest need of spirituality is to help us connect both vertically with whatever we call the divine and horizontally of being of service to other people and to the planet. And so as you get closer to your higher self, you start finding your calling or your vocation, the purpose for which you feel you were here. And that's endlessly inspiring. How should you, what do you, what do you need to, you mentioned a little prayer and calming down and practical things to do to get to that point. To shift from ego. Right, to shift from ego to... Yeah. I, I teach a nine-step process, but the first three steps are really easy to remember, so I'll go over them now. The first is stop the ego thoughts, because the ego thoughts are loud. and they're Example. Like, Give me an example. Oh, what a witch. I can't believe she did that. <laughs> I'm going to get her back. She's always doing things like this to me. Yuck, 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 yuck. And the longer you let those thoughts rumble around in your head, the more steam you build up. Right. And you're not actually getting any better. You're getting more angry. Right, right. So the trick is to interrupt those thoughts. As soon as you hear those thoughts going, going, stop it. It is my intention to come from higher self. I don't want to hear that chatter. And then you need to breathe long, slow, deep belly breaths. Because once the ego's been activated, you've triggered your adrenaline system and your limbic system, and you're in fight or flight mode. And actually, that system shuts down part of your neocortex, and you're not thinking straight. You literally have shut mm. off blood flow to Sounds your higher real brain. familiar. Yes. And we all have those <laughs> career embarrassing, career limiting moments where we go, I can't believe I said that. <laughs> or did that, yes. Or did that, yes. Um, so it's, it's stopping the thought train, breathing deeply, and then asking for help. If you have a divine higher power that you call on, call on that. Call on your higher self. Call on your friends and say, I'm having a major ego moment here. Would you talk me down and right. get me through this? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I guess it would talk me up, right? Because we're talking yeah, talk spirituality. Me, yeah. <laughs> talk me out of the ego and into the, yeah. <laughs> um, give me an example of, of what you do. I mean, you're talking about things that happen at work, and this happens yeah. to everyone at work. Let's right. say you're in a confrontation, someone's yelling at you, and you're starting to feel the anger. Mm -hmm. What do you do? There's a few little tricks I use, and first of all is I hear that ego train get started. Someone's in my face and they're yelling at me, and the initial thought is, what a jerk, <laughs> yak, 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 and I go, stop it, stop it, breathe. And then I really try, while I'm saying, please help me to my higher power, I really try to focus on what that person is saying to me, and remember, it's most likely it's not personal. It's about them, it's not about me, and I need to put my attention on them. And the way I demonstrate to them that I'm listening 
is I will name the emotion that I'm hearing as well as the technical content of what I'm hearing. And so I'll say, I get it that you are absolutely furious right now because somebody failed to do something that was promised. And you see them just visibly relax because you've named what you've heard. They're like, yes, and it should have been done by 2 p.m. and it wasn't. And you go, well, tell me what should have been done and we'll figure this out. And immediately, now you're their ally. You're there to help them. And every all the energy is shifted. You're disarming them. You're disarming them. Because we're expecting them. you to, to respond. Yeah. It's, yes. It's, it's, uh, tell me about, more about inert pause. You talk about inert pause. Yeah, the in, in, like take taking the time. Take the time. You know, the stopping and breathing is a form of inserting a pause. And I say, like, if there was an easy way for me to tell you about how to be more spiritual, it would be inserting a pause between the whatever happens and your response to what happens. Right, right. Because the response is going to be an ego habit response. But when you learn to insert a pause, you're, you're putting a little space in there that gives you room to think, calm down, and bring your higher self forward. Um, there's several ways that are very helpful in the workplace to insert a pause. One of them is just to insert it mentally by breathing and thinking. But you can also take a bathroom break. I mean, I've had this happen in a meeting where it was just about to explode, and I said, excuse me, I need to go to the bathroom, which gave everybody a chance to de-escalate because we took a five-minute break, and by the time we came back, it was just... So it can be I something keep hearing simple. that you should never uh, react when you're angry. Right. And yet, I always feel that you need to deal with it right away. But right. you don't, right? You don't have to if the way you're about to deal with it is going to make it worse. Right, is if you're gonna, angry. You yes. don't deal with it if you're angry. I would say it's generally really hard to be skillful when you're angry because your higher brain is not engaged. You've got this limbic system adrenaline response going on. Give me an example of your own spiritual world. Uh, work, your own spiritual work, when you were working at Exxon. Right. When I was at Exxon, which is a wonderful company, so I had a lot of really good experiences there, but I found that my own, um, I guess the only way to say it is arrogance, was sometimes getting in my way. And as I started doing my spiritual work and I started listening better and putting my own ego aside and thinking about the good of the greater whole instead of what was good for me, that actually things went faster. So I actually got the gratifications I had been seeking before by stopping seeking them directly and instead seeking the good of the whole. So I was able to be more productive. I got my projects approved better. I got promoted faster. My team was more harmonious, all because I had shifted on the inside. Now, uh, well, it, it, sounds, it sounds great, mm -hmm. but it's hard to do, let, it let's is. face it. it is. I mean, you, you have people that are continually annoying. <laughs> yes, <laughs> <You're t> <laughs> everywhere. You try, you try, right, but right. you annoy them, they annoy you. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. What do you do in a case like that where it right. seems to be like a chronic, a chronic problem situation. with, let's say, a coworker or a boss or whatever? Right. What we tend to do is respond to an inflammation with more ego stuff, which is only going to inflame it more. So the first thing to do is to stop what you would normally do and think of a new and different way to approach it. And being direct and naming the problem is usually a good way to start. So you go to the person and you say, look, I know we've been rubbing each other wrong for the last six months. Is there something we can do to fix it? Have I done something to annoy you? I really would like to make this better. So the direct approach offers them a chance to engage their higher self. And it's important when you open that conversation that you come from your higher self because that will resonate with theirs and pull theirs in. But eventually, if these things keep going on, you don't have to be a wimp to be spiritual. You need to be able to set boundaries. And if a person is continuing to do things that are inappropriate, you need to go through appropriate boundary setting, first with them, and then, if necessary, with your boss, with human resources, to get the help that you need. Um, but the final tip I always say is look inside for what you're projecting on this person because it may be that some of this garbage is inside and you are taking issues from previous relationships and projecting it. So see what piece of this is yours and own that too. That's very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, you worked with MD Anderson Cancer Center in a, in a project called Spirit at Work. Explain that to me and, and what changes did you see in the employees that you worked with? Right. MD Anderson Cancer Center is a state institution, part of the University of Texas, number one cancer center in the United States, and very concerned about the whole issue of religion versus spirituality. So we were very clear at the beginning to define the difference between spirituality and religion. You can bring your religion to work, but you can't proselytize. So we, we took all these people, we had to took a group of 30 folks in the hospital who worked together and put them through a one-day training program to learn the language of spiritual intelligence and the nine steps to shift. And then we, for six months, they went through continuous coaching on emotional and spiritual intelligence skills. 
And in, at the end of that period, we went back and surveyed to say, is this now better than it used to be? And they reported significant decrease in stress, significant improvement in teamwork and in productivity, and many of them reported improvement in their home life as a result of learning these skills. Uh, one nurse said that she benefited so much that on the day of class, when she left the class with her little nine-step card and she went back in the unit, one of the folks in the unit got in her face right away and she said, my normal response would have been to yell right back at them. But she said, I'd just come out of your class and I had my nine-step <laughs> card and I was hanging on to my card going, breathe, breathe. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, and I didn't yell at them. I was so <laughs> proud of myself. <laughs> yeah, yeah, to be able to control to control yeah. that, if you're used to reacting all the time, it's, it must be, must be difficult. Yes. Um, tell me about the Spirit at Work Award, because that's sort of a new concept, and MD Anderson won that award. Right. Uh, the Spirit at Work Award is a new award. It's only three years old. And uh, the Methodist Hospital received one in 2002 and Memorial Hermann in 2003. MD Anderson, I think, is planning on applying for one. They haven't quite got it yet. <laughs> but that was created by the Spirit at Work Association, spiritatwork.org, and Judy Neal created it. And now there's co-sponsoring organizations. But the idea is, is that we're re rewarding and recognizing companies for explicitly spiritual policies, practices, or programs. This doesn't mean the company's perfect. There is no perfect company, just like there's no perfect person. But these companies are explicitly saying, we want to bring this spiritual energy into the workplace. We want to allow employees to express what's important to them. And they're doing something concrete about it and have some measures to prove that it's successful. It seems to be like finding the universal concept or the humanity in, in all of us. Absolutely. I mean, all the world religions teach us to love one another. The tough part is how do you love one another? And the skills to shift out of our ego and over to our higher self is really what the world religions and psychology and philosophy have been trying to teach us to do. Now, I understand there's a movement now around the world to create this concept of spirituality in the workforce. This is kind of new. It's, it hasn't been around that long, right? It has not been around in terms of like the public knowing about it uh, until the last few years, but I would say it started bubbling up about 10 years ago, and then the books just started exploding. Um, there are now, I think this year, 22 companies receiving the Spirit at Work Award from all over the world. Last year, I think there was seven, so it's just been growing uh, really fast. And Patricia Aberdeen, who was, wrote the best-selling book, Megatrends, says it is the new and most important megatrend for business to pay attention to. Why do you think that? Because employees are going to start demanding it. We have reached a point in our evolution where more promotions and bigger offices are not going to be sufficient motivators. People are searching for meaning in their lives, and they want to feel good at work. They don't want to come home exhausted. And so finding that connection to meaning and purpose and finding a loving way to be present with each other solves a lot of those problems. How do you know, Cindy, that you're living smart? I would say there's some really important indicators. When you're coming from your ego side, you will be feeling the negative emotions of anger, fear, anxiety, and depression. When you're coming from your higher self, that means you're living smart from a spiritual intelligence standpoint. You're going to feel peaceful, calm, you're gonna, your intuition's gonna be really good, you're gonna feel like you're in the flow of what needs to happen, synchronicities are gonna appear to seem to help you, and life is just gonna be more joyful. You're obviously very happy with, with your family, and, and mm -hmm. you have three teen, no, two teenagers, correct? I have two teens at home and an adult stepdaughter. And I'm, I'm mm -hmm. always wondering, how mm -hmm. do you teach children to be more spiritual? I mean, we tend to be more religious, per se, as parents, right? Mm -hmm. But how do you teach children to be more spiritual? There's obviously in steps in development where there certain things are appropriate, and so religious training can be very helpful to children. But the meta concept, the larger concept around loving your neighbor, is what needs to be modeled by the parents and taught by the parents because sometimes the religious training gets rules focused as opposed to what is the goal. And the goal is to grow yourself up so that you can come from this more loving place. If you as a parent learn how to do it, then you'll be able to help your child do it. And when you see them getting caught in their ego stuff, you'll be able to teach them now slow down, take some deep breaths, let's talk about is there another perspective you could see this from. So you have to walk the talk. You must walk the talk. All right. Thank you so much, Cindy Graves Wigglesworth, for joining us. We appreciate it. My pleasure. And for more information on Cindy Wigglesworth, call her at 713-667-9824 or visit her website, ConsciousPursuits.com. You can also contact the Association for Spirit at Work at spiritatwork.org 
or call the World Business Academy at 1-805-640-3713. That's 805-640-3713 for more information on creating a more conscious corporate culture. Please remember to visit HoustonPBS.org slash LivingSmart for a complete resource list and feel free to share your own tips on bringing spirituality to the workplace. You can call us at 713-743-8513 or email us with your comments at LivingSmart at HoustonPBS.org. I'm Patricia Gross. That's our show for today. Thank you for joining us. Next time, we'll focus on improving the lives of children with disabilities with Mercedes Alejandro. Remember to live smart. Have a great week.